Thank you. I feel like a televangelist with this thing. <laughs> you are! Please! Sorry, bigger hair. <laughs> I do need bigger hair if I want to be a televangelist. Um, thank you, thank you to Dami. Thanks for everybody for showing up. Um, this is part two of, it's like a three-part story and I'm reading the middle of it. And in my story, um, the narrator has met this girl at this punk rock party where there was people with t-shirts that said things like Inhumanity and S Factor 4 on it, real bands from Columbia, South Carolina. Look it up. And he meets this girl and she calls him up and, or he calls her up the following day in his dorm and says, come on down. And this is where the story takes us. Let's start with the first page. It's called My Case of the Jennifers. Usually when people say things like that, my case of the Jennifers, they are in love and every step is bubblegum ice cream. But my case of the Jennifers was a sickness that would rob me of all of who I was. Look at me running downhill from my dorm to Whaley's Mill, huge apartment complex. There weren't any codes or keys, just two doors propped open. Walk straight in. No one at the front desk, down the halls. Only one light bulb was working and it was meat locker cold in there. The door, apartment 1C. The sound my knock made when I folded up my knuckles and knocked out a metal bang. Cold breath out of my mouth. I'm thinking maybe I got the wrong apartment. Maybe there's four buildings in this Whaley's Mill and I'm in the wrong one. But then a narrow bit of door opened up and can you believe it? What she was wearing? How could I not get the wrong impression? One of those white fluffy robes they have in fancy hotels. How could I have gotten the wrong goddamn impression with Jennifer just out of the shower in a robe whiter than her own alabaster skin and nothing on underneath? <laughs> shower warm pouring out from the crack of the door. The folds in her robe covered up the parts I could only see the outlines of. She smelled like shampoo and flowers. Someone had to fly somewhere exotic like New Zealand to get. Her robe, her hands on my arm, that robe and her skin still warm from the shower. A crack of low light from the inside of her apartment. One lamp on in the corner. Jennifer walks me in. Her eyes in the black around them like she always had mascara on. On the walls of her apartment were black and white pictures of old men and women who read the answers to life, the universe, and everything and Jennifer read my mind. I'm not hanging out all morning in this, she said, and for a second I thought she might just drop her rope on the floor. <laughs> You're not that lucky, she said. And I stood there and she waited for me to say something, so what I did next was talk about the photo of Ernest fucking Hemingway on the wall. I loved Farewell to Arms. <laughs> I said, and the way it came out was a leftover from some book report back in ninth grade. <laughs> Jennifer's hand on the door just by the couch, the one that led to what I guess was her bedroom, the black nail polish, fresh on her nails, held on to that knot at her waist, the knot of her robe, what she was holding on to. I'll let you figure out the rest, she said. She gave a little turn to the handle, went in and closed the door. Her voice from behind that door, I'll expect a full report. I sat down on her scratchy gray couch. Against the wall was a stereo turntable AM FM cassette. In front of me was a white candle on the brown square of a coffee table with dried up candle wax melted out into rivers. An ashtray with two butts in it, one white, one brown. I slid out my pack of smokes, whatever was left from last night, sat back on her couch, my metal lighter, the sound of the metal clasp made me feel loved when I lit up my smoke. To the right of me was a big picture window, waves of gray and the brick brown edges of Whaley's Mill. I tapped out a large ash into the ashtray, just two butts in there, white and brown. White with a little bit of lipstick. No lipstick on the other one. And even if I didn't know why there was anything weird about two colored butts in my head, I sure as hell knew it in my body. Because when she came back out in this tight sweater, my tongue laid down in my mouth and wouldn't get up. Jennifer, all I could do was stare at her black jeans, her bare feet on the carpet with black toenail polish, the swing of her earrings when she sat down next to me, the way her hair wasn't straight and wasn't curly but halfway in between. Had to stare at that line of her leg, the little bit of half space close enough to where I could feel her even though we weren't touching. And then she got up and left me with the empty next to my legs, her muffled voice under the cabinets in her tiny kitchen. 
She was waiting for me to say something about her earrings, about the way her ass looked in those jeans, something besides what I said, which was nothing. I might as well have been wallpaper. Don't just sit there with your thumb up your ass, she said, put some music on. Me in my case of the Jennifers, I may as well have had my thumb up my ass for as much as I was willing to defend myself. I should have said, hey lady, you're the one who invited me over here, what am I here anyway for? But I didn't have a voice, all I had was music. If my tongue was going to play dead, if I was going to just sit there and fade into the wallpaper, at least I could find a song that would talk for me. Music was my upper hand. My intricate knowledge of every single song released on every single independent label from 1987 to 1994. <laughs> I knew how to get to her. I knew the song she flipped for. So I got up and I pulled the exact perfect tape right from the big thing on the wall, did a little rewind, a little fast forward, and I stopped her tape player right before my song was about to start. You got something for me, she said. Here was my chance to say, yeah, I got something for you. <laughs> Oh man, all I did was hit the play button. I sat back down on her scratchy couch. The song was this acoustic guitar all alone with keyboards and a list of reasons why I was alone. And it was in the song, not actually. <laughs> and she had to feel the same way, right? The edges of gray and brick brown out the window, my hand warm from lighting the candle with my lighter than my smoke. On the table, those rivers of wax. Oh my god, this song, Jennifer said, and her voice came out of the kitchen, and she stopped making coffee, and she sat next to me, and this time our legs, and I mean both of our legs, hers and mine, they were touching. <laughs> and even though it was supposed to be my song to her, I was still too wallpapered in to say anything, so Jennifer started talking. And sure, I could have taken charge, but I knew she loved the song, and right then, when they were talking to me for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel bad about who I was. And picking the exact song was enough. I mean, if you were me, you totally would have done the same thing. And besides, the stuff she was talking about was what was important. She was talking about winter in Minnesota. There was a bar and a light on in this bar with some rusted beer sign outside. And inside there are drunks. These drunks, they are more of a family than some families are family, she said. And most of the day was Jennifer and I sat there on that couch not talking, not looking at me, not falling in love with me. And then I picked the exact perfect right song and we both got to feel the right away. This was one part of the afternoon, a gap where her eyes gave me a little bit of hope. Hope between Jennifer's eyes and her nose. Hope when she talked about what I can only guess was her family's own drunk lineage. Inside, it's warm and friendly, she said, beautiful and drunk. There are wrecks, but there is beauty in the wreck. She was talking about the song, but she was also saying, you want love and acceptance and a whole new spin on life? Well, here it is. And the way her eyebrows held those eyes of hers and the little bit of half freckle on her nose and her hand on my chest for a second just to make a point, she was beauty in her own wreck. And maybe I could be beautiful to her too, but here's where my guilt comes in, what I am guilty of. Here's 20 years of feeling like shit for having the balls or whatever to try. Here's what I did. I took the thing that we've been so far and believed what it could be, the two of us, the smell of those flowers on her naked skin, the God's honest, no bullshit truth in her voice, the way her hair wasn't straight and wasn't curly, but about halfway in between, her eyes and the black around them like she always had mascara on, her mascara, a layer of protection to keep her from being broken. Jennifer was a kid in this drop-dead sexy body, the way I could see enough of her tits to see them there on this couch with her shirt off and the black bra she had on and the silver chain hanging down around her neck and the shadow around her belly button and the curve of her stomach. And Jennifer looked like she needed someone. She could tell I was looking at her and Jennifer's eyes were all open and big and blue and the tape stopped and I reached in and I got my lips close to hers and ready to kiss her. And she slid all the way over to the other side of the couch away from me. Oh, honey, she said, let's not go there. And her body on the couch sat up straight like this whole thing was an interview I fucked up and now it was time to leave. That's when I should have known, all the way she led me on, opening the door to, in her robe just out of the shower, the way her face held mine, begged me with her body to get closer. The things I never asked her, why did she pull me in so close and push me away? Was she just not aware of what she was doing or was she the most evil bitch ever? Was I just there to like rev her up enough to where a real man could come over and fuck her? A real man? Man, I was like the male version of Parsley. 
And she stood up, and the way she looked at me meant she wanted me to do the same. Stand up, walk over to the door, the open door, and her hand on the handle, and her eyes were not on me, but on the gray, shitty carpet. Those black and white people on the wall didn't hold the keys to life, the universe, and everything. Those eyes said, you fucked up, kid. The two of us on our couch, there never was no two of us. The open door, the portal back to the meat locker cold hallway I could feel even from inside, back to my awful dorm room, back to being the lonely person I was. Jennifer could have ended the whole thing right there. I was crushed and destroyed, but I was almost out of her door, and she put her hand on my hand. In the cold hall, she was so warm, and those blue eyes of hers turned on me for a second. Saturday, she said. We'll see you on Saturday. She gave me hope again. It's the worst thing she could have done. Thank you.